Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning to those of you joining. Um, I am very happy to welcome you all uh, to this um, virtual um, uh, webinar that we are hosting today um, on the right to food and the right to a future. Uh, so we welcome you all for joining and I would like to sort of say a little bit about this, this uh, session, how it will be organized. Before we get started, we have a very uh, distinguished panel of speakers with you today. Uh, this event is being co-organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, I am Lauren Phillips, Deputy Director of a division within FAO that works on the right to food as well as uh, inclusivity, youth, uh, gender equality, and rural transformation more broadly. And FAO is organizing this, this session with Weltfunger Hilfe, and our colleagues are online, the Right to Food Coalition Kenya and OHCHR. So we're very pleased to have you all here today. Um, the event seeks to highlight the critical importance of the right to food for future generations and to explore pathways towards its realization from the perspective of young people and youth representatives. And we're planning to underscore how adopting a human rights-based approach in transforming agri-food systems can facilitate equitable transitions, food security and nutrition for all. This year, 2024, marks the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the voluntary guidelines for the progressive realization of the right to adequate food in the context of national food security by the Committee for World Food Security. And the right to food we know is a fundamental human right which protects all human beings to be free from hunger, food insecurity and malnutrition, which helps to ensure a dignified life for all. But we also know that food systems currently do not fulfill people's rights to healthy and culturally appropriate foods, which are produced in a sustainable and sound method. And this jeopardizes young people's uh, future and the next generation. So, you know, enabling a growing population to access affordable and healthy diets in a context of rapid growth, urbanization, climate change, and growing inequalities requires multifaceted solutions. And that's why we believe that it's very important to consider the right to food guidelines, um, as well as other human rights-based approaches when considering how to shape this, this space and to make sure that all young people as well as all people have uh, the right to adequate and appropriate foods. So let me just say a little bit about um, some technical features of our, our webinar today. Um, I would like to just remind you that this session is being recorded. Um, in interpretation is available at the bottom of your screen in English, in Spanish and in French. Uh, you can click on the globe to pick the language that you would like. Uh, we would like to invite you to ask questions uh, of the panelists using the box called Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for a specific speaker, please do let us know using that same box. And please only use the chat box if you have a technical issue that you would like to highlight. Instead, we would like questions to go through Q&A so that we can make sure to address and capture all of your questions. Okay, without further ado and building on the brief introduction that I provided, we're going to now have a welcome video from Ambassador Gisele, who is the chair of the Committee on World Food Security, uh, as well as the permanent representative of the Republic of South Africa to the United Nations agencies in Rome. She has held numerous roles for the South African government and has extensive leadership experience in public sector administration, policy development, innovation, and evidence-based program implementation. I'm going to turn it over to the video. Thank you. Dear participants, it is my great honor to welcome you all to the UN Civil Society Conference, and more concretely, to this panel discussion entitled, Right to Food, Right to Future, co-organized by Weltanger Hilfe, which is WHH, the Right to Food Coalition in Kenya, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO. This year marks a significant milestone, the 20th anniversary of the endorsement by the Committee on World Food Security of the voluntary guidelines to support the progressive realization of the right to adequate food in the context of national 
food security. The recognition of the right to adequate food is steadily advancing around the world and the right to food guidelines have played a significant important role in driving this agenda forward. Many countries have already made use of the guidelines, for example, to incorporate the right to food into national legislation or to establish social protection product programs aimed at ensuring access to adequate and nutritious food for all. Despite this progress, between 691 and 783 million people faced hunger in 2022. The Right to Food guidelines provide a clear roadmap for action to foster participatory people-centered processes for food systems transformation that address the structural root causes of hunger, not just its symptoms. Therefore, we must keep promoting their use to continue to support countries in adopting constitutional amendments and in developing laws, strategies or policies and programs to further realize the right to adequate food at a national level. Since its reform in 2009, the Committee on Well Food Security, CFS, has developed an inclusive and participatory approach in which civil society and non-governmental organizations, together with other relevant actors, play a key role in influencing the policy debate contributing to the promotion of the human right to adequate food and holding decision makers accountable. As an important constituency within civil society, young people are key to promoting sustainable food systems, ensuring the regeneration of the agricultural sector and contributing to progressive realization of the right to adequate food. However, agriculture and food systems often fail to provide young people with decent work opportunities and dignified livelihoods. And to ensure a balance between the needs of different generations. In addition, many young people, especially women, have limited access to and control over land, natural resources, or the infrastructure, markets, insurance, finance, technology, knowledge, and skills. The Committee on Well Food Security has developed a set of specific guidelines for member states to promote more and better youth engagement and employment in agriculture and food systems as a core part of the efforts needed to fully realize the right to adequate food. Dear participants, the right to adequate food deserves our highest priority and commitment. Join us in making it a reality. I invite you to all to celebrate with us the anniversary of the right to food guidelines at a dedicated global thematic event during the 52nd session of the Committee on Well Food Security in October 2024. Together, let us build a future in which the right to adequate food is fully realized for all people and all generations. Thank you for your dedication and support. I wish you all a fruitful and a productive panel discussion today. Thank you uh, to the ambassador who obviously couldn't join us here today, but for that uh, video, which really sets the stage. Um, and now I have the great pleasure to pass to uh, Dr. Christophe Golay, who will be our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Golay is a senior research fellow at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, and is also a visiting professor at the Geneva Graduate Institute. 
Since 2009, Dr. Goley has been providing legal advice to a number of stakeholders in relation to the negotiation, adoption, and implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas, or the UNDROP. And from 2001 to 2008, he was the legal advisor to the first UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. So Dr. Goley, it's over to you. We're very happy to hear a little bit from you about the status and current challenges on the right to food and particularly with a view on young people and future generations. Thank you, Lorraine. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you today in this um, in this important meeting. Um, so yes, I was, uh, I'm was i working on Red Food since uh, more than 20 years. I've been even in the negotiation of the voluntary guidelines between 2002 and 2004 in, in Rome. That was an important moment during which uh, um, it was made clear now with these 18 guidelines that the right food is, is, is must for the right food to be implemented, we need to have a holistic approach uh, to the to the to food security. And um, as you all know, the the right food has been uh, all uh, has been first uh, recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, in 1948. Um, then in the International Covenant on Economic Social and Human Rights, Article 11, which recognizes the right to adequate food and the fundamental right to be free from hunger. So that's the that's the two main components of the right to food in international law. It has also been recognized in, um, in, the, in, uh, in the CEDAW Convention, for, for example, or the CRC, uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, since the guidelines, we have, uh, we have a really um, uh, guidance on how to implement the right to food with a rights-based approach, and that's, that's very important. Um, in the last years, we have been, uh, there have been lots of work also that have been done on linking uh, climate change, the fight against climate change and, and the right food. And for example, there have been many reports of the UN Special Rapporteur, but also of the UN Secretary General on the right food and climate change uh, June last year, in which there was, for example, uh, uh, the promotion of, um, of something like uh, ag agroecology was pushed a lot by the Special Rapporteurs of, and by, uh, by the Secretary General and agroecology is also promoted a lot by youth people, uh, youth farmers and, and peasants. So that's that's something that is important for, for youth. And, and we all hope that uh, the right food will be key in the uh, summit for the future. Um, um, I will uh, just give a few figures. You all know we have something like 700 million people in the world who are hungry. More than 2 billion people are uh, food insecure, moderately or severely, and more than 3 billion are malnourished. Um, if we look at who are these people, the 80% 80 of those who are uh, hungry are living in uh, rural areas. So that's why the focus in, on the right food in the last 20 years was on rural areas. And that's why there was this negotiation of this UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. Um, and 60 of them are women and girls. Okay, And in many cases, uh, women and girls, because of uh, exclusion uh, and, and discrimination, women and girls are dis discriminated against in many aspects, for example, access to land, access to employment and, and decent salary, uh, social security. So you have lots of discrimination that explains why in the more than 700 people who are hungry in the world, 60% are women and girls. Um, if we look at the... the um, these uh, this, uh, this numbers and these causes, then the right to food is an obvious uh, uh, important response because, uh, uh, as you know, there is a legal basis with the, the these international instruments. Uh, we have a definition of the right to food. It includes the right to food that is adequate, that is available, and that is accessible. Accessible means physically accessible, but also economically accessible, um, and always in dignity. Okay? The, the, the principle of dignity should always be the, the, the one through which we interpret human rights. And so the right to food is the right to feed yourself and your family in dignity, not the right to be fed. Um, and then we have states' obligations. Uh, for example, uh, we have states' obligations to, I mean, since 20 years, we use this typology of states' obligations to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to food, um, and also to ensure non-discrimination and equality. That's, that's ex extremely important. So I'll give now a few examples of implementation in the last 20 years. One is coming from India. In India, since 2001, there was a right to food case before the Supreme Court of India. 
uh, it started with people dying in the state of Rajasthan and stocks not being available but not distributed. And an NGO, human rights NGO, went to the Supreme Court, complained to the Supreme Court. And since 2001, there is a, uh, there have been more than 200 uh, orders given by the Supreme Court in which uh, governments are pushed, of the states of India are pushed to implement schemes, uh, different food schemes. And one is the, are the school meals at, at, at school. And, uh, and after 20 years, the evaluation is, says that uh, more than 200 million children now have, have access to food through uh, the school meals in India. So that's exceptionally important for 200 million children in India. And that it came because of the, also because of this case before the Supreme Court. And, and there is a right to food campaign in India that is very strong and led by, by NGOs and, and youth. Um, we have another example with Brazil between uh, 2003 and 2014. Brazil was uh, was uh, fighting hunger with the right to food. So they recognized the right to food in the constitution. They adopted a law on the right to food. They created a national council on food and nutritional security with the right to food as its core. And um, they were one of the first countries to reach the MDG uh, one. In um, And now in 2014, they were out of the hunger map of the FAO. So which means that we have less than 5% of the population which is in a situation of food insecurity. So that was what was achieved during the, the first mandate of Lula, the, the eight years of the mandate of Lula. Um, they reduced uh, child mortality by three, three fourths in 10 years in Brazil during that period. That's very uh, effective use of the right food to fight hunger with a participation again of a very uh, uh, vibrant civil society like like in India. So civil society youth have a very important role to play in uh, in promoting the right to food. I'll give a last example on the right to food. Uh, in Geneva, last year we have recognized right to food in the constitution. It's um, I mean I'm working on right to food in Geneva since 15 years, but there was no there was no political interest before the COVID crisis, and with the COVID crisis, with the people queuing for for hours to have a food basket. In uh, in uh, in summer 2020, there was a reaction that was giving food aid to people, and then there was a more structural response that was the recognition of the right food in the Constitution of Geneva last year. It was accepted by two thirds of the population uh, by a vote last year, and now we're working on a on a law on the right to food that we hope will cover all the aspects of the right to food that are. Uh, already in the guidelines of 2004, now you have access to land, access to productive resources, access to a decent salary, uh, social social security, but also food aid if it's needed, but with an uh, important role for the for the state to coordinate food aid. Um, so that's uh, that's an important uh, uh, also uh, sign that the right to food now is also being used in in the north, not only in the global south. In the last 20 years, it was mostly in the global south, but now there's a huge interest also to protect the right food in, uh, for example, in Europe or in, in Switzerland. Um, now, uh, a few words before uh, the end about this UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants. So it's been adopted in 2018. It was a six years negotiation process at the UN in Geneva, the Human Rights Council. Um, the first idea 20 years ago came from La Via Campesina, a movement of uh, peasant organizations. Uh, they are present in 80 countries. They represent 200, uh, 200 million people in the world. Um, and um, after the food crisis of 2008, there was a momentum during which these rights of presence started to be discussed. And uh, in 2012, the Human Rights Council decided to elaborate a UN declaration on the rights of peasants. So six years of negotiation, and it was adopted in December 2018. Um, this declaration uh, has is it's very useful to fight hunger because it does recognize the rights of those who are suffering from hunger most, as, as we said, not 80% are in rural areas. Also, there are many articles about uh, youth and the rights of the youth. For example, in uh, rural uh, agrarian reform, uh, land reform, there should be a priority given to youth. And for example, in Geneva last year, we used it. We changed the law to make sure that youth will have uh, access to land. Uh, it will be promoted. Uh, but you also have... Uh, a part of the of the, uh, uh, for example, you also have the training should be given on agroecology for use or this kind of things in the declaration. So the declaration, uh, you have the right to food and food sovereignty in the declaration, which is is the first time in international law that the right to food sovereignty has been recognized by states in Article 15 of the declaration. But you also have the right to land, you have the right to seeds, the right to, the right to decent uh, wage, uh, uh, um, another standard of living, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's it's very very. 
a progressive uh, uh, declaration that was adopted by the states in 2018 by the UN General Assembly. A few examples of implementation. Last year, Ecuador was the first country to, 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 uh, to include the whole declaration in its national law. Um, last year, Colombia also revised its constitution to include the right to land and territory of uh, peasants in, in Colombia. Um, we had also a, a, a few other examples in, in Europe. For example, there is a, for example, there is, it should be the first recognition of the right to seats of peasants in Europe now in the in the coming months. Um, and um, and then we had lots of jurisprudence already at the national level and at the international level, including by the Human Rights Committee. In which, uh, in a case in which it protected the, the right to land of uh, a peasant family in, in Paraguay through the right to life. Um, so yes, lots of things have been happening. And uh, the last uh, development was the creation last year of the working group on the rights of peasants. So there is, you you know, there is a UN special report on the rights of peasants. It's one expert of the UN. So there will be a working group of five experts. They started last week to 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 work, first of May. So there are five experts, one by region, and they can do country visits. They can they have to do report to the UN on the Human Rights Council General Assembly on thematic issues, and they can also receive communications. So there is a lot of uh, things that are going on, and and I hope that it, they can ally with the youth and uh, and that they can also play a role in the in the summit for the future to make sure that the rights will, but also the rights of peasants, the right to land, the right to seats, and the agro-biodiversity agro are promoted by, by youth and, uh, and at the summit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christophe. That was very helpful and really gives a, a, a lot of background that can inform the rest of the conversation today, and we appreciate your, your expertise and knowledge. Um, okay, so we're now we're going to have a, um, a series of panels, panelists, uh, very um, bringing uh, perspectives from across the world, and I'm going to sort of pose some questions to each of them in turn. Um, so I would like to start by introducing you to the first panelist, whose name is Sheila Leona Maloba, and she is a program officer at the Institute for Social Accountability. She leads the pillar on inclusive economies, and her work involves strengthening food systems and human rights-based approaches and advocacy. And she has been working to build sustainable, inclusive, and equitable food systems at the county level in Vihiga. And she has also been working to strengthen accountability for the right to food throughout her work. So Sheila, in your work in Kenya, you're engaged in a project which is on strengthening governance, rural governance for the right to food. And in this project, I know you're supporting the Right to Food Coalition in Kenya, which represents 50 civil society and grassroots organizations. Um, and that the coalition recently conducted a dialogue with young people on the inclusion of young people and actions in food system transformation. It would be great if you could tell us a little bit about that and give us some of the context of the work that you do in Kenya, and then provide some insights from your recent discussions with young people. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, glad to be here uh, this evening. Um, I want to say that uh, together with the Right to Food Coalition, we implement a program called Strengthening Rural Governance for the Right to Adequate Food, which ideally um, is here to ensure that, you know, vulnerable groups are in secure populations, and this includes uh, the youth are able to enjoy improved uh, availability and access to adequate food and not leaving the aspect of using a rights-based approach. So within the project, uh, we employ social accountability mechanisms to enhance and improve uh, duty bearer service delivery related to the right to food at the sub-national level, plus um, a lot of coalition building to influence our legal framework conditions at the national level. So it's true, uh, recently we did um, uh, we did a youth dialogue uh, and we were able to interact with many youths, uh, around 100 in number. And, you know, the context was around how do we ensure that youths are able to participate uh, in, in food systems. And uh, the conversation, we, 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 we one of the things that came out clearly was the access to resources. You know, access to land is a big issue because here in Kenya, you find that um, 
the conversation of succession, you know, youths are not trusted. Uh, you'll find that in regards to even to the land succession issues, um, youths are not given uh, the opportunity to own land because there's the aspect of trust. And then there's also the aspect of um I think more, more so, if I call it culture, the negative perceptions towards agriculture. And I don't know, maybe it's because of, uh, you know, sometimes um, at the rural rev at the rural uh, side, we experience low productivity. So, you know, they're not really motivated uh, to, to, to participate um, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in food systems uh, production. We also got to hear about young women and uh, we were told that young women prefer uh, to participate in value addition processes rather than production. So again, you ask yourself uh, why? Because um, it all comes down to the issue of access to resources. Because uh, if you, you, you ask yourself why are women uh, more likely to take up value addition uh, processes than, than than production. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sheila, for outlining some of the challenges that young people are facing and also making a distinction between the specific challenges that young men and young women face. I think that's, that's very relevant. I would like to introduce our second panelist. I'll come back to you, Sheila, for another question later. But uh, our second panelist is Eliana Antinzala who is a vo advocacy volunteer in the Peruvian chapter of the Young Professionals for, the Ag for Agricultural Development. She's interested in rural youth, agrobiodiversity, gender and public policies. Um, she's an agricultural engineer and participated as a youth representative in the 2023 Global Hunger Index Brussels launch at the European Parliament. And she's also a youth delegate at the World Food Forum. So thank you so much, Eliana, for being here. Um, I know that you're working as a coordinator on a project uh, called Agricultural Agroecological Youth in Action for Peru uh, with the National Association of Ecological Producers, and you're a young agronomist, um, and you support a, a network of young professionals in agricultural development. So can you tell us from your experience a bit about the challenges that young people in Peru are facing, particularly in rural areas, uh, with regards to the right to adequate food and to nutrition? Eh, sí, muchas gracias, Loren. Eh, es un honor estar aquí. Primero, me gustaría eh, comentarles un poco sobre la agricultura eh, en Perú. Eh, la agricultura familiar es la que proporciona el 60-70% de la alimentación en el país. Y esta agricultura emplea a más de 2 millones de familias que representan el, eh, aproximadamente el 97% de los agricultores en, en el país. Pero a pesar de que hay una gran biodiversidad en Perú, eh, el Perú enfrenta serios problemas para el acceso a una alimentación nutritiva. ¿no? Según la última encuesta eh, de demografía y salud en el 2023, el 43% de niñas y niños menores de 3 años sufren de anemia. Y este porcentaje se incrementa al 50% en las áreas rurales. Eh, como hemos visto, el derecho a la alimentación es un concepto integral que incluye eh, los derechos humanos, tal como lo señalan las directrices voluntarias, y tiene el foco en, el grupo, en grupos vulnerables, ¿no? entre ellos a las juventudes. En este marco, eh, la agricultura en Perú, el estado eh, nutricional y las directrices, es importante que podamos resaltar algunos desafíos estructurales que ponen en peligro el derecho a la alimentación para los jóvenes. Eh, primero, tenemos unas brechas grandes en educación y acceso a la salud, especialmente en las zonas rurales. Eh, los jóvenes enfrentamos dificultades para acceder a empleos justos y dignos que nos permitan tener ingresos suficientes para adquirir alimentos sanos. Además, eh, hay dificultades para la disponibilidad y acceso de alimentos para toda la población. En el Perú tenemos una gran brecha de infraestructura que dificulta el transporte de alimentos a todo el país y a ellos se les suman las dificultades que venimos enfrentando eh, debido al cambio climático. Las sequías son cada vez más fuertes en algunas zonas, en otras las lluvias eh, no permiten que se pueda... Eh, producir o justo se dan el tiempo de cosecha y dificulta la, eh, el, el, 
la cosecha de estos alimentos. Los cambios de temperatura también ya han afectado varias campañas agrícolas, poniendo en riesgo las economías eh, familiares y la producción y abastecimiento de alimentos para la población. Eh, Además, los jóvenes enfrentamos el limitado acceso a recursos, por ejemplo, como el acceso y control de la tierra, y además dificultades para acceder al crédito y financiamiento que nos permitan invertir en nuestros proyectos agrícolas o emprendimientos. Estas situaciones empujan a muchos jóvenes rurales a migrar a las ciudades en búsqueda de mejores oportunidades. Sin embargo, muchas veces eh, se terminan en situaciones más precarizadas y esto también genera eh, que hay un riesgo en el, derecho al, en el cumplimiento del derecho al acceso a la alimentación. Pero a pesar de este panorama, eh, identificamos que hay jóvenes que están retornando a sus territorios con ideas innovadoras para poder eh, transformar los sistemas alimentarios locales y además jóvenes urbanos eh, como yo y muchos de los jóvenes en Guaypart que estamos involucrados en procesos colaborativos para poder mejorar eh, las oportunidades en las áreas rurales. Muchas gracias, Liliana. Eh, me interesa mucho que muchos de los desafíos que usted ha hablado son muy similares en el contexto de Kenia, ¿no? Acceso a las tierras, cambio climático, etc. Así nosotros podemos eh, empezar a ver que muchas cosas son similares entre, entre las regiones. I'm going to pass now to our third panelist, um, to Rita. Rita Gurung is a senior program officer at Local Initiatives for Biodiversity Research and Development in Nepal. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I know it must be late there. Uh, she leads a project which links agriculture and natural resource management for nutrition security. And she has extensive experience working with rural communities, including youth and women in remote areas of Nepal, strengthening local food systems and empowering grassroots civil society organizations to become involved in local decision making about food nutrition security. Um, so Nepal is one of the countries that has enshrined the right to food in its constitution and has also adopted progressive legislation on the right to food and food sovereignty. Um, the Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock Development is a focal ministry for the implementation and has recently passed regulation to oper operationalize it. So Rita, can you tell us a little bit more about the context of these legal frameworks in Nepal, please? And tell us about what, um, how youth are uh, being involved in shaping such processes and policies. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I uh, shortly start with the context setting, like right to food or the is the basic human rights and but the our current food system is not being able to fulfill its basic human uh, basic objective of fulfilling the or the ensuring the adequate foods to many countries uh, to main to all so it is also evident that the south asian region and the african region are experiencing heavy hunger so in this case the our current food system which is failing in many fronts uh, due to biodiversity loss climate change uh, it's need to be transformed and in this process the right based approach uh, which put the um, right to food at this center so which ensures or the focuses on the ensuring the rights of the most marginalized communities uh, especially their access to resources participation their needs and more importantly they are uh, recognizing their contribution in enhancing the local food system for example saving the local crops uh, saving the culture uh, culturally accepted food so in this case uh, what we have uh, followed in nepal is right to food or the food security uh, and nutrition security is the prerequisite for the right to food and our overall goal and ultimate goal is ensuring the uh, food sovereignty so in this case what we have uh, approached is um, ensuring the participation of all key actors of the whole food system from the inputs to consumers in the decision making process uh, in the decision making in the decision making process like making the choices regarding the seeds what kind of tools they want to use and more importantly participating in the policy influencing and policy formulation process uh, in this case uh, here comes the role of the youth 
because the youth is uh, in the process of inheriting the food system. So we have right and we have to write in um, inheriting the uh, food system that is um, in a good shape uh, that nurture the future generation. So uh, talking about the legal framework, uh, like you already said, uh, we have just, uh, we have uh, Right to Food and Food Sovereignty Act, which uh, kind of uh, anchor the, all the um, commitments uh, that Nepal have made. And also in constitution of Nepal, we have ensured the uh, right to food as a basic fundamental rights. Uh, and uh, we have uh, recently passed uh, the right to food uh, regulation as well. So um, the right to food act itself was uh, endorsed in 2018. And after six years of a continuous follow up, continuous campaigning, continuous evidence based advocacy, now we have a right to food guideline based upon which we can localize it at the local level because the local government or the local uh, communities are the uh, key actors in process of realizing the right to food. And uh, in uh, talking about how youth are in, involved in the process is um, at the moment uh, we have right to food network and other different kinds of coalition. But I have to say that the youth uh, and within youth also there are different sections like different, um, different ethnicities, communities, uh, gender, uh, that uh, youth is not so much um, involved at it should be prioritized because uh, it's uh, um, not uh, as um, there is lack of particular forum dedicated to the youth uh, and uh, also, uh, we have felt that the, uh, like my previous uh, speakers said, that the agriculture itself or the food system related job itself is not being valued and not been recognized uh, enough so that the people are more interested in this process. So that's it for now. But uh, having said this, having uh, highlighted that the, there is very limited participation uh, as such the how to ensuring the right to food and right or the food sovereignty. But uh, lately, uh, the awareness level have been increased in the uh, youth uh, as well. And we have been um, utilizing the different kinds of forum, including the food system transformation dialogue, world uh, food forum, and other kinds of networks like the SON civil uh, society networks of the scaling up nutrition platforms. And now we are looking for the uh, platforms where the dedicated uh, discussions happen regarding how to make the agriculture or the food system as a, a dignified job and also how to uh, generate investment on the resource research and innovations. Yeah, that's it for now. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. I'll come back to you to ask you another question soon. So first, I want to ask Sheila a follow up question. So I think it was very interesting to hear from all three of you from different regions. Um, but I mean, Sheila, coming back to the way that young people are participating in Kenya, um, how can we make sure that they are not just heard, but that their their ideas, their innovations are actively incorporated into decision making processes around agriculture and food system policies? Uh, thank you once again. I think uh, having uh, bringing in the experience for our work on social accountability, it's quite important to emphasize, you know, youth representation uh, in decision making bodies, uh, you know, in government committees, advisory panels, and even task related uh, forces related to agriculture, so that the voice of the youth is never is not left out in whatever decision making uh, platform that is there. We also need to encourage youth, you know, uh, to work together because there's power. There's power when 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 you stick together, and they are able to serve as um, important platforms for amplifying uh, youth youth voices. You know, um, here at the county level or uh, at the grassroots level, we have youth. Um, we call them uh, youth bunge machinani, sorry, in Kiswahili. So these are just youth, youth caucus groups, you know, where they're able to bring their voices together, bring their issues together. And, you know, ultimately they can support each other and ensure that, you know, they're able also to participate in policy discussion and also in, in, in advocacy campaigns. Uh, the other thing would be, you know, let's not, let's not, um, 
uh, consult youth um, just once. Let's have continuous uh, youth consultations because here in Kenya, one of the experience that we've had is, you know, uh, the government coming up with, with, with programs, youth targeted programs. But at the end of the day, those programs don't pick up or we don't see the impact of such programs uh, uh, on the youth. And the reason is because they were not... Um, uh, they were not consulted, you know, public participation didn't go in depth as, as, as it should be. So you find that good programs where resources have been used, uh, you know, also that time to invest there, but then you end up investing um, in the wrong, in the wrong program. So uh, the other bit is uh, we have technical training institutions here in Kenya. Can we try to invest in such uh, learning institutions so that the youth can get to be provided the skills and even the mentorship so that they may, they may be able to build um, their capacities in regards to, uh, you know, coming up with, with value addition in regards to food systems. And this will, this will, and ultimately even the mentorship bit, because this will help them to effectively engage in policy discussions, articulate their needs, and even advocate um, uh, for their interest. So uh, for me, for us to really include the youths in the policy processes, it's one, let's create the spaces for them. Let's ensure uh, if there's a space that a youth is supposed to fill, let, it, let, us, let us ensure that it's filled. And once we've had their voice, you know, we are able to pick up the, the, the issues and, um, ultimately uh, get programs or policies that are youth friendly and we get the, the much impact that is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. I think you gave a lot of very interesting ideas there, you, including young people more than once and in a continuous process of dialogue is really important and making sure that they have ways to have collective voice as well as providing training. So that's great. Um, let me turn to Ileana again. Ileana, can you please provide some examples of innovative practices through which youth have overcome some of the challenges that you mentioned before in participating and what kind of support do they need to maintain engagement in those kinds of uh, activities? Um, muchas gracias, Loret. Bueno, actualmente eh, los jóvenes en Perú nos estamos organizando en diferentes espacios y colectivos. Eh, En cuanto a los retos vinculados a los sistemas alimentarios, existen diferentes iniciativas lideradas por jóvenes. Una de ellas es el trabajo que estamos realizando con Guaypart Perú. A través de este voluntariado, jóvenes profesionales de diferentes carreras se reúnen para plantear acciones vinculadas al desarrollo agrario. Eh, uno de los ejemplos es la Escuela de Jóvenes Ruralistas. Es una actividad que este año ya va por la séptima edición. Eh, el objetivo de esta escuela es fortalecer conocimientos y capacidades y habilidades de jóvenes líderes como agentes de cambio en el desarrollo agrar eh, agrario rural. Estos jóvenes pasan por un proceso de formación vinculado a la gestión de proyectos agrarios para ser ejecutados en sus territorios o, en todo caso, en colaboración con organizaciones rurales. De esta manera, se busca impactar de manera positiva en el sistema alimentario desde una perspectiva de las juventudes. Otra actividad, eh, otras actividades que realizamos en la organización están vinculadas a la investigación sobre juventudes rurales. Participamos en espacios de incidencia y plataformas multiactor con el objetivo de garantizar que nuestras voces eh, estén presentes. A través de estas experiencias y con instituciones aliadas, hemos podido replicar este método eh, de la escuela y adaptarlo para llevarlo a cabo en dos regiones rurales eh, del Perú, junto con la Asociación Nacional de Productores Ecológicos. Eh, y estamos buscando que esta escuela sea un medio para crear redes y fortalecer el liderazgo de jóvenes agroecológicos, en este caso. Esta iniciativa es relevante ya que en el Perú no existen suficientes mecanismos que faciliten el acceso a espacios de formación en temas de agroecología. Eh, y de esta manera buscamos fortalecer los conocimientos y también empoderar a las juventudes para que logren una participación activa dentro eh, de la gestión y, plan y planificación de organizaciones agrarias, como es en el caso de esta Asociación de Productores Ecológicos. Eh, 
ese es un ejemplo de las iniciativas que estamos realizando para enfrentar los, los retos que tenemos. Y para responder a la segunda pregunta, eh, es, necesario que, es necesario que fomentemos espacios de verdadera participación, donde las juventudes no solo seamos una cuota en el discurso político. Necesitamos que los estados, los organismos internacionales, las organizaciones locales, garanticen nuestra participación efectiva, tanto eh, desde la identificación de las problemáticas en, las, en los espacios rurales, en los sistemas alimentarios, así como el diseño y la ejecución de políticas públicas. Como mencionaba mi compañera, no es solo ser consultados una vez, sino que realmente eh, nos den el espacio para estar eh, en, envueltos en todo el proceso. Bueno, y como les he estado comentando, hay un sector de las juventudes donde ya venimos articulando esfuerzos que contribuyan al diseño de las acciones y estrategias para el desarrollo agrario y para el desarrollo de la agroecología. Pero mucho de este trabajo es voluntario y autogestionado, por lo que escalar las distintas iniciativas es un gran reto para nosotras y nosotros. En ese sentido, necesitamos que tanto los estados y la cooperación internacional puedan canalizar recursos hacia las juventudes, puedan invertir más en las juventudes y de esta manera eh, contribuyan al fortalecimiento de las organizaciones juveniles para que estos sueños colectivos se materialicen y contribuyan a la, a la construcción de sistemas alimentarios más justos, eh, donde el derecho a la alimentación eh, no sea un privilegio. Muchas gracias, Ileana. Thank you so much for your, your thoughtful response and also for reflecting um, on some of the various things that have worked well in, your, in the context of Peru. And I think there's a lot of lessons that can be shared across the regions. So, um, Rita, I'm going to turn to you for another question, but I just wanted to remind all of those participating that you're welcome to put questions in the Q&A box, because uh, after I ask Rita another question, I'll give some space to ask your own, your, to um, vocalize the questions that you're writing. So, Rita, another question for you is about um, how, what kinds of initiatives are needed to ensure that young people can contribute to advancing the right to food? So how can they shape local government priorities, uh, you know, shape budget allocations, um, and those kinds of activities which are intended to improve food systems? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, let me first share that the, in Nepal also, like uh, in most of the developing countries, youth migration is uh, for the better opportunities is one of the um, area that is affecting our social and economic settings. And it is also visible that the our uh, resources like agricultural land are being left barren. So our first thing is uh, food system or the agricultural job itself uh, should be uh, made desirable and uh, and better options for the livelihood uh, generation. So we can in, we need to invest uh, on the generating cases, successful cases, research, uh, innovations, so that the youth are attracted and they take it as one of the uh, priority. So in this scenario, uh, what uh, we are working uh, is promoting or the prioritizing uh, through evidence-based advocacy for the investment. So the investment in young people's capacity to be leaders in the food system is very important. So this can be done through the education system, research system, and also uh, more importantly, uh, making the food, uh, food, food system jobs viable. So for example, uh, like um, we can um, educate or the sensitize, uh, raise awareness the school uh, through the school programs, uh, developing local syllabus, and also um, the research system should focus on the uh, valuing and the recognizing, building on the local resources, local culture, local uh, innovations. Uh, and uh, another thing is more, um, the important part is skill development. Skill development and access to finance for young business entrepreneurs, innovators is the key. So we have seen that um, in Nepal, um, lots and um, significant numbers of youth 
uh, migrant returnees are investing in the agribusiness, uh, promoting the organic farming, agroecology-based uh, uh, farming produce, producers, and then they are also promoting uh, linking the agriculture to the tourism, as tourism is one of the economic pillars of Nepal. So in this scenario, uh, they incentivizing such activities, which not only boost the economy, but also promote the nature-friendly solutions or promote the agroecological farming system that should be incentivized incentivized and I think a government of Nepal is uh, promoting this uh, and as we are in words of uh, in a process of developing the agroecology roadmap and uh, uh, we are I want to highlight the the awareness raising in sensitization is very key among youth because how we can be part of this process and how we can uh, create the differences because uh, we are the future so that is most important and uh, and we should be accountable and we can make the government or the duty bearers accountable as well and in this scenario right like i already mentioned we have just uh, passed uh, regulation on right to food and food sovereignty localization so in this process what uh, we as an organization and as a civil society are working in the in its localization process so in lo localization process the youth uh, based uh, um, uh, government uh, youth based uh, civil societies are capacitated in uh, to participate in the government uh, process of the planning and making a policy so that they can, they have the space to share the uh, concerns and also get platform to influence processes based on uh, how based on utilizing the what we building on that so we have some successful cases uh, in some part so the youth uh, civil society organization are actively advocating for right to food and also uh, ensuring the their participation in the process. For example, we have multi-sectoral nutrition plan and they, that have different kinds of com committee at the government level. So we are also seeking our participation in that forum so that we get the dedicated uh, space uh, for the um, for raising our voices and also uh, making the system itself accountable and transparent um, so another uh, thing uh, what we at this civil society level also we are uh, investing in the uh, innovations that are uh, friendly to gender friendly tools and technologies to promote the local crops such as finger millet or that is climate resilient um, and uh, also one thing I want to highlight here is uh, for the right to food, for uh, its uh, uh, realization and advancement, the political commitment is very important. So the youth uh, leaders are the key actors in this case. And they also need, uh, we have realized that the uh, knowledge and capacity enhancement on their part is also very important. So we work with the uh, so it's very necessary to work with both the uh, uh, duty bearers and right holders so that we can achieve the our ultimate goal of right to food and uh, food sovereignty. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. That was a very rich answer. We appreciate that so much. Okay, there's a couple of questions in the chat. If others have them, they're welcome to post them. Um, as we as we just heard from Rita, let me pass first to Sheila. There's a question about uh, access to land for you in Kenya. So it says uh, access to land for young people is a major issue. Can you tell us any examples that are going on to tackle the bottleneck on uh, land? Thank you uh, so much for that question. I think what is happening here in Kenya is that we have the law. The problem is, uh, you know, just community education on how, uh, uh, you know, families should initiate uh, succession work and even just community education on culture issues because culture seems to be the bottleneck of some of these um, um, uh, some of these uh, land issues and of course um, and one of the things uh, we, we we are seeing on the ground is uh, there's an opportunity for land to for, for the youth to do you know land leasing 
because they are, you know, no one is stopping you from 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 leasing land and 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 producing food on your own. So for me, I feel uh, various organizations uh, together with the county, together with the government, uh, we need to do a lot of uh, community education to to sensitize communities on how they can do succession plans. At the same time, uh, speak to the youths on some of the options they have, and one of the uh, you know, low hanging fruit is in regards to land leasing. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sheila. I think that's very helpful. And when, when you're talking about cultural barriers, you also mean norms, right? About who should be able to inherit land, women, men, children, et cetera, I imagine. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Rita, there's a question from my colleague Juan, who just joined last week to be the new head of the Right to Food team here at FAO. Um, he said that um, he was part of a process to support legislative legislative basis for agricultural cooperatives in Nepal. And one of the challenges during that time was to make them attractive to young farmers. So can you tell us anything about the role of cooperatives and the realization of right to food in Nepal or how we can make cooperatives attractive to young people? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, agri uh, cooperatives, especially the agriculture cooperatives, have very important role to play in the realization of right to food. And uh, right now, because they are one of the key actors in promoting the local food system or the uh, capitalizing uh, the local resources, uh, you know, for the economic uh, activities generation. So uh, in case of youth, um, so we are linking the cooperatives, um, ag uh, cooperatives, ag agriculture, uh, cooperatives work with the in income generating activities. So the youth uh, are very much interested and government has different kinds of uh, programs, sub subsidies as well to the cooperatives. So that is one um, interesting fact. And another thing, uh, um, in case of Libert, <clears throat> we are also utilizing the cooperatives in uh, the um, uh, promotion and the conservation of the local crops. So that is one of the key mandates of the local our government, like the uh, local crop genetic diversity conservation. So the cooperatives are involved in the process and they receive the dif uh, different kinds of incentives like the technologies and the financial support as well. So this is the case and the, um, like I already said, we are, generally focused on the food and nutrition security and do it, while doing so, we ensure the partition of the um, male and female, um, we ensure the participation of the marginalized communities in the uh, in the cooperatives committee. So uh, yeah, this uh, through these different activities, we are going there, I hope. That's great, thank you, thank you so much. We appreciate your answer. Um, Christoph, can I pose one of the questions in the chat to you, please? There's a question about explaining the difference between the right to food and food sovereignty, which I thought I would give you the chance to explain. And then there's also another question on the major challenges that indigenous peasants face. Um, and I might also, Ileana, I might come to you on that question after Christoph speaks about it. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, yes, so the depending on where you sit, I mean, for the special patent right to food, food sovereignty is a tool to reach the, to, to obtain, to, to realize the right food. And for the food sovereignty movement, uh, the right food is one of the elements of the food sovereignty. So that's, I mean, it, it can be either way, it's a tool or it's the objective, it depends where you are. But uh, what we can say is that they are very complementary. Um, they are different in terms of, because we are talking about the human rights with the right food and we have monetary mechanism like the special partner. Uh, we have state obligation, we have treaties to which uh, states have to, uh, said reports to the treaty bodies. Um, while the food, with food sovereignty, we, it's promoted mainly by La Via Campesina since 20 years. Um, it's been included in some countries in Latin America, in the constitution. And uh, also at the local level, it can be promoted. So for example, in Geneva, we have a law on food sovereignty. We, we promote local product for local consumption. Uh, but it is the first time with UNDRAP that it has been recognized by state in international instruments. Before, states were reluctant because they were saying that it was it could uh, go against the rules of the World Trade Organization. So they didn't want to recognize the right food for sovereignty. But for the first time in Article 15 of UNDRAP, we have both the right to food and food sovereignty. Um, so we will see how it will um, be implemented through UNDRAP uh, realization or monitoring. But uh, that's, that's yes, it's great that since now six years, 
We have a legal basis also for, for food sovereignty, but uh, we, if you look at the definition of food sovereignty, they have six pillars and one is the right food. Uh, they are very complementary. Thanks. Thanks. Christophe, did you want to take also the part of the question about indigenous peasants in particular, any challenges particular or? Sorry. So, um, in, uh, so we did many country visits in Latin America with the special tongue dried food. So for example, in Guatemala, uh, we, uh, in Guatemala, if you are an indigenous child, you are three or four times more malnourished than non-indigenous child because uh, of uh, history of discrimination. There have been a 36 years of civil war in which, during which indigenous peoples were evicted from the land. There was a peace accord at the end, but they were never, uh, and they should have got their land back, it was never implemented. So you have this kind of, uh, yeah, very strong discrimination. You have some countries in which with Bolivia, no, they, they really made an effort to include indigenous peoples. Even one of them was the president in the in the policies. So 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 that they yeah they, they are the first victims also of discrimination and and hunger and malnutrition in the countries where they are. Um, but and they of course you, the question is about indigenous peasants. So uh, many of them of course are peasants. So they suffer the same kind of uh, of discrimination and exclusion and violations of their rights that, than peasants. Um, in the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples, they, they have the right to land and territory, something that has not been recognized for, for peasants. It's only the right to land. Um, because of this, uh, we recognize the, this collective management of land that is given or should be given to, to indigenous, indigenous peoples. Uh, yeah, so they, again, it's a complementarity between peasants, protection of the rights of peasants and indigenous peoples. But in most of the, I mean, in many countries, they, they are the first victims of hunger, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you so much. Eliana, do you want to add anything about indigenous peoples in Peru from your experience? Oh, eh, sí, gracias. Eh, sumado a lo que comentaba Christoph de que se enfrentan a mucha discriminación, por ejemplo, eh, aquí en Perú uno de los mayores retos es el acceso y seguridad sobre la tierra. Existen muchas leyes para la titulación de tierras eh, de comunidades campesinas y de comunidades indígenas. Eh, sin embargo, es un proceso muy lento que lleva eh, muchísimos eh, pasos que dificultan que esta titulación sea efectiva. Y al no tener titulación en muchos territorios, eh, sobre todo amazónicos o donde hay industrias extractivas o el agronegocio, la, la exportación, eh, se ven amenazados. Por ejemplo, en el caso de comunidades amazónicas, eh, al no tener titulación, pueden ingresar mineros ilegales, eh, taladores ilegales, que además se enfrentan a la comunidad y muchas veces ponen en peligro eh, las vidas de los dirigentes o las dirigentas que denuncian estos actos ilegales. Lo mismo sucede cuando hay comunidades cerca de zonas mineras eh, en las partes altoandinas, donde también si hay temas de contaminación o de apropiación de tierras, eh, es difícil que ellos puedan reclamar porque no tienen su título. ¿no? Y ese es creo que uno de los principales retos que como Estado eh, debemos enfrentar ¿no? y poder acelerar estos procesos de titulación para las comunidades nativas y las comunidades campesinas. Muy bien, gracias. Um, Sheila, I'm not sure there's a, there's a very specific question about aflatoxin. Can I pass that to you? I don't know if you saw it. It said, um, at what point is Kenya with the aflatoxin problem that emerged some years ago? And how is it related to the right to food? Yeah, so I want to say uh, here in Kenya, the, in regards to right to food, food safety uh, is one of the issues that the right to food coalition is really pushing uh, to ensure that the government, you know, the obligation of the government to protect uh, 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 its citizens against, you know, harmful food. Uh, is one of our key campaigns. And uh, if you look, if you take a case of the aflotex, aflotoxin case, um, most of the time, you know, uh, it's related to not only products that are related to maize, and we understand that maize is a staple food uh, here in Kenya. So it, it crosses over even to other, uh, let me call them 
uh, products, you know, like 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 groundnuts and 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 water view. So the problem uh, still exists. I uh, I think it was worse ten years ago, but the government has made uh, improvements uh, towards the years so that farmers are able to improve, you know, farming practices. We have government. Um, institutions which ideally you know institutions like calro uh, which ideally can uh, uh, help farmers to to ensure that they are able to improve with with best um farming practices so the, i want to say the problem still exists because to some extent um it's because of uh you know us farmers and the way we 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 store our product, but also at the same time uh, we've seen and we 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 have documented cases here in Kenya where we have products like peanut butters, uh, peanut uh, butter, uh, being recalled from supermarket uh, shelves because of high levels of aflatoxin. So uh, again, it's a conversation of accountability, and that's why uh, here at Kenya we are really pushing for a right to food uh, legislation because when we hear of such cases. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, there needs to be somebody who's really held uh, accountable and, uh, you know, is is charged uh, by law. Thank you. That's really helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of your answer. Um, I think I'm going to pass to our closing speaker. I see that there's two more open questions. My colleagues from FAO are going to post some relevant links for those questions in the coming moments. So, don't feel that we've ignored the questions that were specifically to FAA, we will answer them now. But um, in the interest of time and to make sure that we uh, let you all go uh, on time, I'm going to ask uh, Shafiq Ben Ruin to join us to provide some closing remarks. Uh, Shafiq is a human rights officer who has the responsibility of working on the right to food mandate within the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Shafiq, thank you so much for joining us. Let me pass to you to, to close. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Chair. So today, as we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the of the voluntary guideline for the progressive realization of the right to adequate food, but also the 10th anniversary of the small scale fisheries voluntary guidelines, let us try to reflect on the significance of the right to food uh, in shaping our collective future. In 2024, as we stand at the crossroad of unprecedented challenges, from the specter of hunger haunting millions to the looming shadows of climate change and conflicts, such as in Gaza and Sudan, the imperative to safeguard the right to food has never been more pressing. The right to food, enshrined as a fundamental human right, encapsulates our shared commitment to ensure that every individual, regardless of their circumstances, enjoy access to nourishing and culturally appropriate sustenance. Yet, the stark reality of our current food system paints a sobering picture. Too many people still grapple with the harsh reality of hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. Our agricultural practices put a strain on the delicate balance of our ecosystems, exacerbating the very crisis we are trying to avert. In this pivotal moment, we are called upon for trans transformative action. The path forwards demands nothing short of a paradigm shift in our approach to food production, distribution, and consumption. It calls on us to embrace holistic solutions that are not only efficient and resilient, but also inclusive and sustainable. The right to food guidelines, the SSF guidelines, alongside the UN declaration on the right of peasants and other people working in rural areas, furnish us with a roadmap to navigate these uncharted waters. Crucially, our journey towards realizing the right to food must be guided by the voices and the aspiration of the youth. As, as torch bearers of tomorrow, they have the vision and the strength to take us toward a future in which hunger is a distant memory. By harnessing the power of innovation and collaboration and by providing them access to productive resources, they can forge a hand towards a world where food security is not a privilege, but a birthright. In closing, let us reaffirm our, co our commitment to the right to food and pledge to redouble our efforts in the pursuit of a more just and equitable world. The Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights remains committed to working with youth organization toward this goal. And thank you so much. 
Thank you, Shafiq, for this very uh, important and impassioned statement about the importance of the right to food and the participation of young people in realizing it. Um, I would like to thank our excellent panelists, Christophe, Sheila, Rita, Eliana, as well as Shafiq for participating. Um, to my colleagues who co-organized this event and to all of the colleagues who have participated and listened in, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate your um, being here today. If you have additional questions, you can feel free to follow up the Right to Food team at FAO or our colleagues at WHH. Thank you and have a good afternoon or evening.